thought that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 440th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the astonishing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. <laughs> it's amazing how it always comes up that way, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Every day I do my energy blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com, and you can go there and find these articles. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, 21 articles that we picked from the energy blog in the last week. The best of the blog. The best of the blog, and um, the the uh, you can go to a link that is down lower than this on the on the um, on the on the uh, what you're looking at. You know, if you're looking at it at YouTube or BCTV or whatever, you can you can find a link to the to the. Uh, site that we use for developing it, or you can download the contents of that site with a file that's there. And you are supposed to say some of these are actually worth rereading. That is what I usually <laughs> say about this time. And uh, there's one of them this week got over a hundred pictures attached to oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's really an interesting... Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you can spend about a week just on that on one On that link. one, yes. Well, when you're ready, we can start up. Do you well, want to? Let, let's let's start up here. I'll put okay. Both on Whoa. Here. Whoop. How did that happen? I, I saw. Well, you know, I pushed the I pushed the pushed the key <laughs> down. I pushed the key down, and it's um, it it's it goes to the picture I want, and then it just keeps going. And um, this article is from Clean Technica. Well, there's a picture of a house there, and I'll pull a house picture yeah, up. Yeah, it's a lovely house. I'd, I'd like to live in a house like that. It reminds me somehow. There's one at the end of my driveway, right next to my, where I park my car, that looks just like this. Really? Except it doesn't have the fence. Well, you now, know. It's a cute little house. It's a like cute little house. It would, be, it would be lovely. I would, I'd like to have a house with that, like that with a... With a wood-fired kitchen stove, I love cooking on a wood-fired kitchen stove. Well, they're pretty practical because they provide a lot of heat for the house. They do indeed, and uh, and, and some you know, way or another, okay, here. When I am. my kids were little, I had a wood-fired cook range and and loved it. Okay, Clean Technica, got a title for us? Uh, let's see now. <laughs> Don't mind Tom. He's uh, he's got to do two things at once. I'm trying to. Oh, here we go. Yeah, this thing isn't scrolling. You got the wrong one. That's the one you scroll with. You're right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, <laughs> I've scrolled it and I found out how to bring more clean energy into our homes. Yep. What if you could help climate change um, f uh, from your ho home without lifting a f finger? How? How if you? How, what if you could help climate change? Combat climate change from your home without lifting a finger and reduce your climate emissions to zero. RMI, which is Rocky Mountain Institute, released a blueprint for how regulators, policymakers, utilities, and solutions providers can support every American in bringing clean energy home. And I have a note to say exactly the same thing. <laughs> so I won't say it because you've already said it. Well, yeah, we don't need to hear it twice, although sometimes things have to be stressed. Well, let's move along. We got another interesting picture coming up here. Yep. Whoop, what? Yeah, that's the same picture. <laughs> Come on, you. It's kind of a nondescript picture. There, there you, you go. go. Solar plus storage. That's what we're looking at. Yep. Accelerate renewables to reduce power costs. Yeah, the load fronting net, net zero report. Uh, That's what it's called. Which comes from uh, Wartzilla, is that right? Yeah. Vatsilla. Vatsilla? Vatsilla. You, you looked it up. <laughs> I looked it up. Oh, good for you. Uh, not, says, not Wartzilla, but Vat Vatsilla. Vatsilla. <laughs> I believe you, absolutely. <laughs> says that electricity production costs could be reduced by up to 50% by 
by 2050 if countries and states adopt 100% renewable systems faster than currently planned. The renewable energy could be, uh, would be mainly wind and solar photovoltaic backed up by um, energy storage systems. Well, the article says that accelerating renewables to become the main source of electricity drives down fossil fuel usage. Duh. <laughs> Significantly reducing the overall levelized cost of electricity. Right. So this is the key sentence. Significant cost reductions can be achieved with renewables by utilizing energy storage and thermal balancing power plants, which if you've been watching the show, you know all about. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, we got another picture coming up we here. Do have We're a coming picture. a little closer to home here. Now, I want to tell you, Tom. Yeah. I have been on that stretch of road. I'm sure I have too. In Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, <laughs> and that Pennsylvania. That same stretch of road, it moves around. It moves around. <laughs> that particular stretch is near Westerlo. Well, Westerlo was right outside of Albany. It's yeah. about 25 miles southwest of Albany. Yeah. And uh, when I were, was living in Albany and working for the state, there's a little, very, very little, I think it's a state park in, in this town of Westerlo. Oh, okay. And we used to meet after work, you know, and share lives and drink beer and stuff like that. There you go. Right in the town of Westerlo. And the town of Westerlo is how big, Tom? Oh, Kind of small, as I recall. I was going to say 1,500 people, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, Westerlo passes renewable energy laws. In New York State, the Westerlo Town Board unanimously passed three renewable energy laws two weeks after it approved the town's first codified comprehensive plan. The laws cover wind power, solar facilities, and grid scale battery systems. The state's goal is 100% renewable energy by 2040. Well, these laws are in response to resident complaints about commercial solar fields springing up. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to push, push the picture up, up again. I guess you would kind of spoil that image with anything in there. But Actually, I, the, the power line and, or telephone line, whatever that is, and poles spoil the image. It's already spoiled the image. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, if you want to think about it, the barns in the background spoil the image. And, <laughs> and so does the fact that all the trees that were on those fields one day were cut down. They were. Absolutely. Change comes. And you know, as I think about wind turbines, I think about going to the ocean when I was a kid and being able to stand there on a beach, or it was not a beach actually, I was kind of at the, at the top of a rise above a beach, and look out and see ships. Okay. And those ships were eyesores, if you want to think of them as eyesores. Yeah. And they were lovely, if you want to think of them as lovely. <laughs> and I look at wind turbines and I think of them that way. And they do not make people sick. I'll explain that to anybody who wants to know. And they don't make a whole heck of a lot of noise either. No, they don't. Well, we got a picture coming up here of some flow batteries. Let's yep, see if and I we're, can. we're going up to uh, Friday, push. October 8th. So now, this you, is interesting because flow batteries, well, I guess I'll, I'll mention that in a couple of minutes. Yeah. But uh, they require reservoirs, and these things don't look like reservoirs. Well, they probably have tanks inside them. I was them. thinking they either tanks inside or they got external yeah. tanks, or if, if the... F and if the water or the electrolyte they use in this flow battery is salt water, you can have ponds. Yeah, well, I wonder. <laughs> You'd probably have to be very careful that they be kept clean. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And honestly, I don't think I'd want inland salt water ponds. <laughs> I think some, some birds might get very upset at that. But nevertheless, what do you have for a title? The first ESS flow battery to go online this month, and ESS is a, well, you're going to tell us what that is. Yeah. I just realized that I made a slight mistake in the previous article because I didn't say who it came from. It came from the Aldermont Enterprise. This one is from uh, Clean Technica. Iron flow batteries use three of the, um, of the most abundant elements on Earth, iron, salt, and water. And this salt actually is sodium chloride, as far as I can tell. But their technology is new. ESS, based in, in Oregon, 
And you know, I don't have that expanded. I think I think it might might just be, I don't know. What well, what ESS stands for? Yeah. I looked it up and uh, it hasn't been called that in a long time. That's, it was something like that back in 1880 or something. Wow. Like it was ESS. Okay, it has pro products ready to go and signed a deal with, the, uh, with SB Energy, a division of SoftBank, to provide two gigawatt hours of iron flow batteries between now and 2026. Well, I, I will explain what these flow batteries are. Two specialized liquids, in this case, is, is just salt water. On both sides. Yeah. It's the same well, thing. Well, adjacent to each other, separated by a membrane. Yeah. Which allows electrons to flow back and forth between the tanks while keeping the fluids separate. The scaling is simply a matter of building tanks large enough to keep the liquids apart until needed. Yeah. So they don't even have to be tanks. They can be ponds. They can be just about anything. Yeah. Um, well, flow batteries are cheaper, and they can store more energy than lithium-ion batteries, and they use three of the most, these, these iron flow batteries, use three of the most abundant elements on Earth, iron, salt, and water. They can last for more than 20,000 charge and discharge cycles, okay? And they can provide energy for up to 12 hours. Yeah. And they have a life expectancy of 25 years. Yeah, and, <laughs> and when they break down, they're usually most flow You can batteries. recycle everything. You can recycle everything or you can repair them fairly easily. So we're going to be hearing a lot of about flow batteries as the technology progresses. Well, there was one thing in this article that I noticed that is worth talking yeah, about, and that is, here. according to this article, these flow batteries cost $25, $25 per kilowatt hour. And what that means is the flow battery, the, the amount of battery that you need to store one kilowatt hour of electricity is $25. And I remember that 10 years ago they were talking about when the cost of storage goes below $200 per kilowatt hour. And this is at the 25 right? And this is at 25 which is just a sixteenth well, of that. The times it's, they are it's changing. Going to, it's going to make <laughs> dramatic changes to the grid. And I, bear in mind that $25 per kilowatt hour is saying that about the flow batteries is kind of like we're ta a flow battery is like a, a tank truck. The tank truck costs a number of dollars per gallon. Um, the electricity, which might cost 20 cents per kilowatt hour, really doesn't compare in its price. So $25 per, per, ki per kilowatt hour is very, very low and it could make a huge difference. Uh, will make a huge difference if these things pan out, but they, they well, obviously the, the grid they, as we know it is dead. Yeah, dying. Or well, dying. Yeah, and it's going to be replaced by renewables. Uh, and you know they talk about the grid needing a bigger grid because of renewables. We've got to put in more stuff. I really think this harkens back to uh, to the the previous paradigm and the idea that in the future uh, with renewables we're going to be running the same kind of paradigm with huge plants. Situated somewhere well, that, that was the Edison model. Yeah, huge, and, huge plant as we had as they built in Niagara Falls, for example. Yeah, and the wires everywhere. Yeah, and the, the new grid that is evolving as we speak will be distributed power. I think that's absolutely I mean, we're, correct. We're going to see almost everybody generating their own power in the next few years. I think that's absolutely At true. At least a little means, bit of it. Which means that if we have local power in Vermont then we can reduce the amount of transmission that we, that we need. Oh, yeah. You know, and if you look at the st statistics about, for example, bird fatalities, birds are killed by, more by transmission lines than they are by wind turbines. I believe that. Yeah. yeah. I believe that. Okay, should we go on? I think we should. we got another picture coming up here. Okay, that's an oil rig, yeah, and I just picked that, that up that at Unsplash. Up. And uh, we have That's a... It's an oil rig, isn't it? Yep, and we have an article from Food and Water Watch. And what it says is this, I quote, Hundreds of scientists tell Biden, halt development of fossil fuels now. I hope yeah. he's listening. I hope so, too. More than 330 U.S. research scientists sent a letter to President Biden urging him to use executive authority to stop all new fossil fuel projects and declare... A climate emergency actions they say are necessary to avoid the worst damages of the climate crisis. 
Well, from the article, it says, listening to science means acting on science. Yes, I suppose it does. <laughs> it means stopping new fossil fuel projects, opposing industry delay tactics. No, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> and declaring a national climate emergency. This emergency is caused by burning fossil fuels, and the only way out is to quickly ramp down and end the fossil fuel industry. It's a true statement. We're, every dollar we put into developing fossil fuels at this point is a dollar that's being thrown down a well. Yeah. We're not going to get that back. And it's very tempting, given the, given the energy uh, situation in Europe right now, to say we need more fossil fuels. But the fact of the matter is it's not going to serve us in well, anything but the... Sh it's gonna not going to serve us in the short run because, because we've got to develop it. Whoops. Well, that's okay. That's coming up anyhow. I'm going to bring that one right up. Oh, there you go. And let's bring it up. This is a, this is a, ta these are tangled lines from, in Puerto Rico. Well, this is interesting because they could have taken this picture in front of my house. <laughs> in here in Brattleboro? Right here in Brattleboro, there's a pole that looks like that. Not quite so tangled. Oh, man. But and it's right there. It's right in front of my apartment. And house. things do go wrong. I was sitting on the front porch of the house that I'm on, and all of a sudden... There was a shower of sparks across the street. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it came coming down from a, this was a couple of years ago, coming down from a utility pole. And we called the, we called the, uh, the... What well, caused uh, it? A bird or something? No, it just, uh, I don't know, maybe... A, uh, just happened. Yeah, but maybe <laughs> the wind blew or something. It was, it was not a bird. It, and I called the utility company and they sent people out to the wrong pole and decided, <laughs> decided that it was okay. And then somebody had the intelligence to come to the come to us and say, are you the people who called this in? Yeah, it was that pole over there. <laughs> and the guy just looked at it from the ground and said, oh, uh -huh. I suppose. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't even know that I read that. I don't think you I haven't read, read it. No. Puerto Rico's power grid in critical condition. Officials fear complete collapse. Yeah, this is from NBC this is, News. This is real. Yeah, it sure is. This is from NBC News, and you've got to remember that Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, the grid was not in the greatest shape when Hurricane Maria hit. And then it was owned by the state, I think, and they yeah. sold it to a private company. The private company hasn't improved things at all. Yeah, it's it's very sad. Puerto Rico is on the pro in the process of declaring a state of emergency due to the quote critical critical condition end quote of its generating power plants and lines here. It doesn't say that in front of me, but that the declaration would help speed up, quote, the acquisition of essential goods and services required to fix their generation units, end quote. They've got a problem down there, and they did the day after this article appeared declare a state of emergency. I think we're, are we going to touch base with this again, this, this I show? don't think so. I don't know. Well, I know that Puerto Rico's in trouble. They pay twice as much for power as mainland U.S. customers. So do we. Twice as much? Close to it. Well, we're on a high end, but I don't think we I, pay we're, twice as much. We're, well, yeah. And less than 3% of Puerto Rico's electricity comes from renewables. Which is sad. I mean, they should have gone They should this. have a lot there. They should, yeah. <coughs> okay, should I we? I think, well, it would... would, would you know the story behind the story is it was it was pre it was publicly owned, but it was being uh, manipulated. Yeah, it was a political thing. Well, let's move on to Saturday, October 9th, and we have a picture of somebody who was jubilant. Yes. This, by the way, I think it might be the most important story of the week, and it really didn't get much coverage. Clean environment is a human right. UN Council agrees. Yeah, this is from The Guardian. Um, the UN's main human rights body voted to recognize the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. That's interesting. <coughs> it That's sure interesting. is. The Clean Environment Resolution was passed by a vote of 43 to nothing. Four member states, China, India, Japan, and, and Russia, all abstained. I wonder why. Well, the, I think each of them had its own reasons. Huh? I think each of them had its own reasons. I'm sure it did. I mean, if you think of this, <coughs> China and India have got bad environmental problems. And to say that the people... Well, they both burn a lot of coal. <laughs> what? They both burn a lot of coal. Yeah. 
<coughs> and I think that voting for this would open themselves up internally for lawsuits. Um, Japan, I don't know, but Russia is selling as much fossil fuels as it can, although it's while not. While it still has it. <laughs> yeah, while it still has it, although it's. Sell them, they're trying to take over the European market. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And they are, they are manipulating the prices in Europe, I believe. But, um, yeah. Well, from the article, the UL, UN will appoint an expert to monitor human rights in the context of the climate emergency. And this is a quote, global recognition of this right will help empower communities to defend their livelihoods, health, and culture against environmental destruction. Right. And help governments develop stronger and more, co more coherent environmental protection laws and policies. Well, it starts off by saying it's a human right. We've got to recognize that. Yes. And anybody who fools around with that human right may be guilty of a crime against humanity. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay. Well, we've got a very interesting picture here. This, to the audience, I will say, believe it or not, is New it's York City New York from City. space. It's, to no most people, it's upside down because north is usually, usually up, up on a map. And in, this in this case, case, north is down. North is in the lower left corner. Lower left corner. But that's the island of Manhattan in the middle. Well, it's all, it's all of New York. I can see the Jerome Reservoir in that map, which is right up near where I lived in the Bronx. Okay. And the, and the, um, the right-hand side of the map is mostly New Jersey. Mostly New Jersey. It's all, that's where all the refineries are. Yeah. Right exactly there, the Bayway refinery is the largest refinery in the world. In a very convenient place to have anything that they release blow right into some of the most densely populated real estate in the United States. Well, some genius must have figured that one out. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, this is from CNN. What do you have for a title for the article? The energy crisis couldn't have come at a worse time for climate. Yeah, Chinese officials are ordering coal plants to ramp up production greatly. The EU is facing a revolt over its ambitious Green Deal on climate. The U.S. President Joe Biden is petitioning OPEC nations to boost oil production. Clearly, energy is getting priority over climate. Say that sentence again. Clear That's the problem. Clearly, energy is getting priority over climate. And this is, I think, this is because, largely because, the Russians reduced the amount of, of uh, gas they were selling to Europe with the pandemic to the minimum amount, and they have not allowed it to increase. So the Europeans are stuck for energy. And because, at the because same Russia's time, playing games. Yeah, I think, they're, <laughs> I think he's playing games. He realized that Russia can do it all by itself. It doesn't need OPEC. And so... A little takeaway from the article. Yeah. A rush back to fossil fuels is worrying experts particularly in the phase-out of coal, now in closer reach than at any other time in history. And we're seeing that. They're phasing out coal. Yeah. But it's very, it's happening very slowly. Yeah, it's well, happening. Stranded assets. Yeah, it's happening far too slowly. A better response would be to, quote, turbocharge deploying renewable and energy efficiency programs. And it looks like that's what the EU is doing. They're, they are saying, some of the people who are in policy level at the EU are saying openly, I believe that Russia is doing this on purpose, and the only thing that we can do to answer it is to increase the amount of renewables we've got. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Maybe they should be paying you the big bucks. Well, too. you know, why, why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free? Absolutely. Okay. We have a picture of nice, ice. Nice picture of an iceberg here, don't we? Yeah. I'll pull that one off. And this is from Clean Technica. It, it, the article says it's the Arctic. Well, how do they know that's not the Antarctic? Huh? Actually, <laughs> actually, it was uh, Mike Dunn at NOAA who said it was the Arctic. I. Uh -huh, you. Oh, I see. I see. So. Well, in Arctic experts and scientists out unqualified political operatives. Just what we were talking about. Yeah, we sure were. The Arctic region is warming three times faster than the rest of the world. We've the way said that th before in this show. Yes, absolutely. The way the previous administration approached, approach dealt with this was to purge the Arctic experts and deny the climate crisis. It ain't happening, folks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nothing to look at here. But recently, the Biden administration has taken important steps to repair the damage. This is from Clean Technica. Well, for, there's a takeaway from the article. The Arctic is transforming 
from a region of ice and snow into a greener, wetter, warmer environment that is impacting the rest of the world with sea level rise and atmospheric uncertainty. So that's basically not good news. No, it's not. However, well, let's move along here. We've got a nice picture of, of what are these things? I, they look like tree trunks to me. They look like trees, don't they? Yeah, this is October Well, the article Sunday, says October it's 10th. a forest, so I wouldn't argue with that. Okay. <laughs> this is from Clean Technica. Critical protections restored some... Uh, critical re protections restored for NEPA, the U.S.'s bedrock energy law. And you're going to tell us what NEPA is. I will indeed. The Be Biden administration restored some critical protections to the National Environment Policy Act, our nation's bedrock. That's NEPA. Yeah, bedrock environment law, which had been eliminated by the previous administration. The rule puts the focus back on the public rather than corporate interests. I want to point out here, NEPA. Do you know when that was signed into law, Tom? I read that from the article, I think. It was quite a while ago. 1970. Okay. Who was That's president in 1970? Yeah. Who was president? 1970? Yeah. I don't know. Richard Nixon. So they did this under Nixon. They did. The, Richard Nixon signed the law. Yeah, yeah. You know, our, our conservative president, real conservative. <laughs> Richard Nixon may have had problems, but he was a real conservative. Yeah. Donald Trump is not a real conservative. Not so, at all. Of course, he tried to undo what Richard Nixon had done. And, you know, there it is. Well, a new rule reverses the previous administration, I wonder who that is, that required alternatives considered in an EPA review to be focused on the interests of the applicant. <laughs> okay, I want to, I want to put a, a toxic waste dump next to your house, Tom. I'm the applicant. Surely they should favor me over you. Well, not on the interest of the community. Yeah, absolutely. Finalizing this rule will recenter the public interest. Absolutely. And that's where we have to be. Well, let's move along here. We've got another picture coming up here. This, is, this might be one of the most boring pictures we've had all year. Well, that's a, a screenshot from the Tesla YouTube video yeah. of the Tesla, Tesla Berlin factory, yep. which, by the way, is huge. Oh. Tesla's building two factories, both of which are giant world-sized factories. I think you could put a couple of baseball fields in each one. They're huge. They're, they're, in, they're enormous. Well, Elon Musk at Giga Berlin, quote, Tesla's mission is to accelerate the world to sustainable energy. Yeah, Elon Musk is not fooling around here. <clears throat> and it's interesting that his bottom line on his company is not to make as much money as possible. It's to save the planet. And Musk is an interesting guy. He is. Tesla is an interesting company. Yeah. And uh, these guys are on to what's going on. Yep. This is from Clean Technica. Tesla, which started out as an automotive company that was mocked and jeered by Legacy Auto, officially own, opened its factory in Berlin. So Tesla, now the leader of the automotive industry. How'd that happen? Yeah. <laughs> opened its newest factory right in the heart territory of Legacy Auto. There's an interesting video tour in this article, if you want to look it up. It's a video tour of the Giga Berlin factory. Yes, which is and what this came from. And I looked at it, and it is very, very, 17 varies large. <laughs> it is noticeable that the company has opened its newest factory in the heart of an industry that has long laughed at them. Isn't and it? And presumed it would fail. And what this factory is about is creating high volume, affordable electric cars and hopefully also battery packs and maybe solar. The yeah. overarching goal is to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Yeah. And it's, it's working. Okay, from this ex excruciatingly dull photo, we come to that. This is a nice picture. Isn't that? That's Byblos, which is, by the way, the area that the Bible was named after. Do you suppose that's an old town? I would think. <laughs> it's, it's Lebanon. Uh, I had a friend who came from Lebanon, and he, just, he used to talk about it. It's, it's apparently quite a nice place to live. Well, it, doesn't that look like a nice town? I mean, if you are going to live in a town, doesn't that look like a nice town? <laughs> Certainly has some interesting It's kind of cluttered, but... Uh, that's all right. This is from the BBC. 
Lebanon left without power as the grid shuts down, yeah, huh? Yeah, <laughs> Believe it or not, this could happen to us. Lebanon is without electricity and the, dark, the country is in darkness in the midst of severe economic crisis. The grid is no longer working at all. The government official, a government official told Reuters news, news agency that the country's two largest power stations, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the names, had shut down because of fuel shortage. Well, why did they have a fuel shortage? Simple, because they didn't have the money to pay for it. I think that's what the article says. The power grid completely stopped working to, at noon today, that's what the article says, and was unlikely to restart for several days. And they explain why. The past 18 months, Lebanon has endured an economic crisis yeah, and extreme fuel shortages. And that crisis has left half its population in poverty, crippled its currency, and sparked major demonstrations. Yeah. Many already depend on private diesel power generators for power. Can you imagine you, you want to turn the lights on, you've got to go outside and turn on your generator? Yes, I can imagine. Okay, we're up to Monday, October 11th. We got a picture of a car here, don't we? we have a picture here, of a car. Is it, um, is it just any old car or it's what? It's a Tesla Model 3. Tesla Model 3, isn't and it? And the person who took the picture obviously was in another car that was being passed by this vehicle, which is probably driving too fast because the condition <laughs> of the road is wet. Looks like kind of oh, wet, Oh, well. Yeah. This is from Clean Technica. The Tesla Model 3 outsells Audi 44, BMW 3 Series, and Mercedes C-Class in Germany. Well, they don't mean anything to me, but... <laughs> uh, it has been, uh, it has to be a shock to Audi, BMW, and Mercedes, the proud triumvirate of premium German auto uh, ma manufacturers, to learn that Tesla Model 3 outsides, outsold all of their mid-sized combustion engine offerings combined, combined. Yeah. in <laughs> Germany in it? September. They must be doing something right. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you, Audi, BMW, and Mercedes are clearly doing something wrong. Well, definitely uh, BMW. They are they aren't even talking electric cars. It's sad because you know I always thought of BMW cars as nice and, cars, and, yeah. And they made motorcycles that were quiet, which was something I appreciated. Never sell in America. Well, they did <laughs> with people who cared about their ears, which unfortunately is not as many people as there should have been. But as a group, they racked up sixty-one thousand sales in Germany just in September. Model Three sales. Total 6,800 uh, 6, sales. It's, it says 6,800. It means 68,000. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I noticed oh, that. I looked at the number there and it said it doesn't compute. Yeah. The company, this is this was from the article that it's true. The company needs to dismantle its old factories and replace them with new, more efficient production lines if it wants to be competitive with Tesla. Yeah. Overall, the story is the transition away from fossil vehicles. In September, 41% fewer gasoline-powered vehicles were sold in Germany compared to a year previous. 42%? 41. 41. So the, <laughs> so the, the fossil fuel uh, automobile market is down 41%. Definitely. Yeah, people who that, just aren't, aren't buying them. That is what I would call a severe depression. I would say. And in the meantime, electric vehicles are increasing sales. Well, I got something to say here about it. It didn't come from the articles, but it's yeah, something go ahead. had been confusing me, and I tried to unconfuse it, okay? Yeah. We, the articles all talk about talk in terms and generalities with initials. BEVs and HEVs. Yes, I know. What are they? Well, BEVs are battery electrical vehicles. Right. Powered by batteries alone. Charging is via a plug, no internal combustion engine. Yeah. And a model for that is the Tesla Model 3, which we just took a look at. Yeah. HEVs, okay, we got BEVs are battery electric vehicles, HEVs are hybrid electrical vehicles. Hybrid because they have two power drives. They got an engine and they got a motor. Yeah. Okay, they can't plug in. So you recharge your battery using your engine. And there between the two is a plug-in hybrid. Well, that's the next one, the PHEVs. Yes. Plug-in yeah. hybrid, hybrid electric vehicles, which, by the way, are the ones that are outselling out the other two. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, a plug-in hy hybrid electric vehicle can travel on batteries or the internal combustion engine. Yeah. And this is leading in sales right now. And a perfect example of that is the Toyota Corolla. Yeah. Okay, I it's got a significant engine, it's got significant batteries, and it can swap either way. Yep. Okay, um, we are going to uh, where? We're going to Nebraska. A nice picture of, uh, here of we a go. flooded here nuclear go. power plant. That picture, That's the Missouri by the way, is, River. That picture is 10 years old. That's the Fort Calhoun plant, which closed. Well, it, it, it stayed open after this event. Yeah, they, but it didn't stay open for long. It was only a couple of years. Well, I've got it. It, it shut down in October of 2016. So it was five years. Okay. So it lasted for five years. The, the uh, Fort Calhoun nuclear plant is on the Missouri River near Omaha, Yeah. which is in Nebraska for those who aren't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and the report finds that 25% of all critical infrastructure, which I will define, in the U.S. is at risk of failure due to flooding. 25% of all critical U infrastructure in the U.S. is at risk of failure due to flooding. That's scary. It is. Um, this is from CNN. As a massive investment to repair roads and adapt to, to climate change faces an uncertain fate in Congress, a report finds that much of the country's infrastructure was already at risk of being shut down by flooding. As the uh, planet heats up, the th that threat is expected to grow. You know, when Hurricane, um, uh, what was the one that, that hit New Jersey? Oh, the one that just hit it? No, it was six or eight years ago. Oh, I can't remember it. <laughs> it ca came up and gave us a little trouble, but not terribly. That, was that the one that's destroyed my car? No, that was um, that was a, that was an earlier one. Yeah, that was about ten Imelda? years ago. Imelda. I don't even remember anymore. I, I don't remember. Sandy, Sandy was the one that hit New Jersey. When that happened, Oyster, the Oyster Creek nuclear plant was running. It isn't anymore, but it was running, uh -huh. and the water came to within about a half an inch of topping its its um, berms that protected it from seawater. So we could have had a. Well, it, 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 it had closed down. It was far ah. better prepared than, than it, it might have been. And this wasn't a tsunami. But nevertheless, it could have flooded really badly. Well, they talk about critical infrastructure. So they say that includes police and fire stations, hospitals, airports, wastewater facilities. That's critical. But also generating facilities. Well, they don't say that, but it certainly does. Yeah. Flooding is the most common and costly disaster in the U.S. And if there is a ground zero for flood danger in the U.S., it is Louisiana, which we've talked about here. Oh, it's frightening when you think about Louisiana. Cameron Parish in southwest Louisiana is which, the most vulnerable county in the U.S. Which we've talked about which many we, times. Several times. Yeah, yeah. Florida is also home to some of the most flood-prone counties in the country. Yes. Okay. But the whole east coast of the United States, the whole Gulf Coast, they're both. They're, they're all in danger. Yeah, really. they really are. And from the article, it's going to get worse. Well, the some threat of, the... of flooding <coughs> is growing rapidly. Right. Floods this summer killed dozens of people, and caused billions of dollars in damage, from Louisiana to Tennessee to New York City. As global warming melts ice sheets, it raises sea levels and tilts the odds in favor of more extreme rainfall events. The risk is going to grow. Yes. Okay, our next item is uh, from Clean Technica. A nice picture here. Yeah, this a nice picture of a dy dystopian. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like That's an oil fiction. platform. It is a real oil platform, not something that was made up by some movie. Um, this is uh, this, this is for real. That's a helicopter. There's a helicopter about to land on it. That actually is not all that big. I mean, it's probably about 15 stories tall. But there are much, much, much bigger oil platforms than that. Oh yeah, yep. Our ocean is stressed enough. Give it a break from drilling. Yeah. On top of record-breaking heat, 
record-breaking wildfires and record-breaking <laughs> drought. I'm having trouble. I was going to say wildflowers instead of wildfires. 144 gallons of oil spilled last weekend in Southern California. It is the latest in a string of disasters reminding us that our addiction to fossil fuels has devastating consequences. Say that sentence again. It is, a rem it is the latest in a string of disasters reminding us that our addiction to fossil fuels has devastating consequences. These are lasting ecological, economic, and public health damage. Yeah, and people They're don't not going think, away quickly. Yeah, people don't think about this. Um, the, the editor of, of Green Energy Times, Nancy Ray Mallory, told me that she lived, I think, in Pennsylvania. It might have been in New York. But one night while she was living there, uh, there was an explosion uh, not far from where she lived. She, I don't know that she heard it, but it was, it was a, a couple of miles down the road. And what had happened was a big propane tank had started to leak. Well, propane as a gas is very, very heavy compared to the gases in the atmosphere. Yeah, it sits near the floor. So it sits near the floor. It, in this case, it flowed downhill and gathered in, an, in a low area. Uh-oh. And then that low area. Set the stage for something bad to happen. Oh yeah, and that low area, of course, was in an area that where there were houses, and something set that thing off, and it just blew up, and it blew up, burned a bunch of houses. Several people were killed. Well, the ocean is now the warmest it has been since science began measuring. Yeah. More acidic than any other time in the past. Are you ready for this? Fourteen million years. Oh my gosh. And losing oxygen, ending new leasing for offshore oil and gas is crucial, both to mitigate climate change as well as to help marine ecosystems become more resilient. We need to protect 30% of the ocean. We need to protect more than that. Yeah. And transition away from fossil fuels. But it's the money, stupid. Yes, that's right. The and this is from the article. The Biden administration plans to move forward with an offshore lease sale of over 80 million acres of the Gulf of Mexico. What's he doing? Well, that might be an obligation that was that the government entered into years ago. You know, we don't know. Well, it will result in a production of 1.1 billion barrels of oil and 4 trillion cubic feet of natural gas over the next 50 years. Yeah, assuming that it actually goes ahead. You know, we, we, saw, we saw leases sold a couple of years ago in various parts of the, on land. And when it, when, the, when it came time for the leases to go to, to, for sale, the amount of money that was made by the federal government selling them was very, very low, far below what they thought they would get. And part of the reason was because the big oil companies just were not even participating. And the reason is because you've got to put money in before you take money out. So they didn't you, want to spend the money. They don't want to spend the money. You're going to put money into something for a year before you finally get a, get an oil well? Forget it. Yeah. You know, wh what's the market going to be like a year from now? If you look at what's happening, the oil industry is losing customers. Well, and they are. It's going to get... <clears throat> they are. I mean, renewables are the worst thing ever happened to them. Yeah, except that some of them, of course, are taking advantage of that. Well, they, they have become very, very large and wealthy because of oil. Yeah. And, uh, and they want to keep their they, business plan. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, speaking of business plans, here's a business Tuesday, plan. Uh, Tuesday, which is October 12th. Yes, that's right. So we got a nice picture of a... Uh, GE Halide X turbine. Yeah. And although, it's a relatively small one. Yeah. And this is from EV Wind. GE Renewable Energy receives a turbine supply order for Vineyard Wind offshore wind farm. This is a significant order. Yeah, and guess where Vineyard Wind is? Well, it's just south of Nantucket. Yeah. And Vineyard and Martha's and, Vineyard. And Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> GE Renewable Energy announced that it had received an order from Vineyard Wind, a joint venture of Copenhagen uh, Infrastructure Partners and Avangrid Renewables, for 62, 62 of them. That's 60, a lot. Not only that, not only is it 62 of them, but it's the 13 megawatt the special ones Holly that they just, X they, turbines. They just certified. Yes, for Vineyard Wind One, the first utility-scale United States off, offshore wind farm. Well, that wind farm will be producing almost a gigawatt. 
Yeah. Almost, and big gigawatts are gigawatts. That's right. And in that particular location, it might have a capacity factor of 50%, which is getting really close to the capacity factors of, um, of natural gas plants. I didn't realize they were that low. Natural gas, actually, you know, Tom, some of the, many of the coal burning power plants in the United States have capacity factors below 50%. Uh huh. Because they're shutting down because they're they haven't, down. Got, haven't got customers. Well, from the article, and this is just repeating what I said, Vineyard Wind is located 15 miles south of Martha's Vineyard yep. and 35 miles from the mainland. And Vineyard Wind South, which is coming after Vineyard Wind 1, is adjacent to that. And I've looked at it. It's a, they've got two areas set aside that are about 20 miles by 50 miles. <laughs> Just, you know, this you is can, where they're going to be building. You can paddle all day from the in, <laughs> outside of that and not even get to the middle. Well, this Heliad X-13 MW is the most powerful offshore wind turbine built in the world today. Yes. That's going to change, fellas. Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a picture of a glacier. Is that what that is? That's a well, glacier. Well, you know, huh? it, this, is a, this is a disturbing picture because the glacier is in the lower right. Look at those mountains. There's all, almost no snow on them. And where is the glacier? It's sitting in the middle of a very big puddle. Well, this is the very lowest tip of South America. Yeah. And it's, it's in Argentina, but it's called... Uh, hmm. I don't, have a, I don't have a name of it. Well, it's a very... F <clears throat> Argentina has this little, little piece of land sticking down. Are you talking about Tierra del Fuego? Well, what... You, well, it's part. It's all part of Tierra del Fuego. Oh, okay. I was looking for a different word. Tierra del Fuego is pretty cold. Well, that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. Well, they are within the length of the state of Florida, of the Tropic of, of of the uh, Antarctic Circle. Of the Antarctic Circle. So they're pretty far south. There. Yeah, we're talking about cold. It, 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 you, you don't expect to see glaciers in Argentina, but you don't think No, of you know, everything in, everything in Latin America is warm and, and <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, that part of Argentina, I got news for you, it's cold. It's cold. <laughs> uh, CNN. Climate crisis is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Um, the World Health Organization, in a special report, is calling for governments and policy act, act, uh, makers to, quote, act with urgency, end quote, on the climate and health crisis, the, the report says climate change is the, quote, biggest, single biggest health threat facing humanity, end quote. Now, I want to point out, we have a health crisis because of pollution. We've got a climate crisis, and both of them result from the same thing, which is burning fossil burning, fuels. Burning stuff. Yeah. The report highlights key climate issues that are already affecting public health which include air pollution from the burning of fossil fuels, and it includes 10 recommended climate and health actions, along with the research and support of why each action is beneficial. We don't have time in this show to talk about them, but it's, no. it, this would be a good one to look up. Yeah, this it's a is, long article. Yeah, yeah. Okay, our next item comes from Clean Technica. And we have seen that truck before, but it was painted differently. Okay. <laughs> That is an electric truck, and if I understand it correctly, it's made by Renault. Yes. Although, you know, when I was a kid, yeah. Renault came out and introduced its first cars in the United States during the Winter Olympics, and they called it Renault. Did they? Yeah, they called it the Renault Dauphine. Okay. And, and that was their, their advertising. Everybody called it Renault because of their advertising, and the first time I heard Renault was years <laughs> later, and I thought, what? <laughs> this person insists on, fr fr on pronouncing French words and names as though they were French? <laughs> okay. uh, how dare they? Yeah. Okay, Europe's you... policymakers lag behind truck makers on CO2 emissions. Yeah, this is from Clean Technica. You, EU policymakers are lagging behind truck makers. Uh, when it comes to CO2 emissions, a study shows improvements in aerodynamics and fuel efficiency, as well as flexibilities of, in the regulations, mean trucks can already achieve the European Union's 2025 CO2 reduction target rather easily. So basically what they're saying is 
the car companies are coming, or the truck companies are coming up with cars, trucks that are way ahead of the regulations. That's what they're saying. Well, from the article, the EU needs to drastically increase the production of zero emissions trucks throughout the decade yeah. to ensure the industry decarbonizes in time. Yep. And it says most truck makers have made voluntary commitments for electric sales, which go far beyond what the EU requires. Right. So they see what's going on. Yes, and absolutely. I think they're looking at a market and they're saying, you know, hey guys, this is good for us. Yes. Okay, we're up to Wednesday, October 13th. And we Already? Have a, Gee, we're having fun here. Yeah, that's right. And this is groundbreaking at, at the uh, Middlebury well, College. Let's take a look at this. Look this at particular article, was it, I took it from Renewable Energy Magazine, but it was all over the place. Well, we got a game to play. Look in that picture, see if you can find uh, our senator. Well, the senator is in the, right in the He's middle. He's right in the middle there, wearing a blue suit. Yeah, and you know who is the second person from the right looking down and so you can't see her lovely face? No, I don't. That's Molly Gray, our lieutenant governor. Is it really? Yeah, she was, she was at the works um, a couple of weeks ago, and I went in and met her. Uh -huh. And, you know, she's as, as charming in person as I think she, uh, I would have expected her to be. And she asked if she could be on this show. Did she really? Yes, she I'll did. I'll be darned. Bring her on. <laughs> well, I told her she could come anytime she wants, and I'm, I'm sure that by now she's forgotten about the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> she's got a lot of work to do. So she's going to be the next governor? I don't know. I, wouldn't, I would vote for her. But, you know, I went into the lobby of the co-op and I came across Becca Balin and she was... She's pretty smart. Oh, Becca. I love Becca. <laughs> and she was, she's been on this show and um, she was collecting signatures. So this was a long time ago. She was collecting signatures for a petition to be on the ballot. And I told her, Becca, I, you know, I'm really disappointed that you're running for senator. And she looked so crestfallen. And I said, I had kind of hoped that you would run for governor. <laughs> and she said she just did not want to run for governor. And I said, that's okay. Do what you want to do. I trust you. Well, the picture is of a groundbreaking ceremony, if I hadn't figured that one out. Yep. And what they're groundbreaking for is a project at Mid Middlebury, the college. Yep. Solar project brings Middlebury College closer to a 100% renewable energy goal. Senator Patrick Leahy joined leaders from, the middle, from Middlebury College, Encore Renewable Energy, Green Mountain Power in the state of Vermont and Middlebury, the town of Middlebury, to break ground on a five megawatt solar project. Now, if that's the same size, same size we have in as town. the one at the, at yeah. the old um, Which if you dump. go down there and look at it, it's huge. But yeah. as, as things go, it's small. Yeah, well, there's one coming up, and I, don't, I think it's next week that we're going to talk about it. That is, just makes that look, a, look like a grain of sand on the driveway. I got a picture in my computer of five megawatts versus 50 megawatts. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, this is five megawatts. It's a solar project that will provide 30% of the college needs. Well, this is an interesting takeaway here. Flocks of sheep will provide vegetation management Don't at the site. Don't you love it? <laughs> Eventually, the site will feature pollinator-friendly plants and shrubs that attract an increased number of bees, butterflies, and other insects that will help support crop production. Yeah. And Middlebury College is going to buy all of the electricity generated at yeah. the site. This is a win-win situation. Absolutely it is. Absolutely. Well, according to the article, Leahy stated, quote, As we grapple with the consequences of the climate crisis, it is clear that these are not just economic benefits. It is an economic imperative. Oh, yes, absolutely. So we've got a next article from CNN. Oh, this doesn't look very good. No, it doesn't. Uh, a little iceberg there, isn't there? Is it? Well, uh, Could be. Either that or a very large shark's tooth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I picked this up from Unsplash for this article to it's illustrate. It's a weather disaster, huh? Boy, I'll tell you, that ship does not look like it's going to float again, does it? I don't think so. <laughs> it looks okay. like, it, from looking at the picture, it looks like it's on a pro in the process of running aground. I think it has, yeah. yeah. It looks like it's. It looks like it's really, yeah. Well, let's move on here. Yeah, this is from it, CNN. It is from CNN. There's many, 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 seventeen more many's photographs in this picture. Oh yeah. It's just all all loaded with. Well, photographs. I could have used almost any of them, but I couldn't because they had they had copyrights. Copyrights. So I right. went and found this one. Well, in the U.S., 
18 weather and climate disasters this year, this year, have killed over 500 people and cost over $100 billion. $100 billion, 500 people. Weather and climate disasters have taken 538 lives so far this year and cost over $100 billion, according to NOAA. The United States averaged $7 billion disasters in, uh, in 1980 to, uh, to 2020, but during the last five years, that, uh, the average number has risen to 16. So this is just another indication of how climate disasters are increasing in number and in intensity. Well, so far for 2021, yeah. right, we've had nine severe storms, four tropical cyclones, two flooding events, one combined drought and heat wave, one wildfire event, one combined winter storm and cold wave, September alone be brought devastating impacts from four of the 18 disasters. Yeah. Flooding from Hurricane Ida, which hit New York pretty bad. Yep. Okay, landfall of Hurricane Nicholas, which didn't do a heck of a lot of damage, and ongoing drought and wildfire and tormenting communities in the West, which we talked about on this show. Yep. The temperature of the entire year was almost two degrees above average, making it the tenth warmest year to date on record. And September was the fifth warmest September since they've been keeping records. Which was in the 1880s they started. 127 years ago. Yeah. Okay. By the end of September, nearly 50% of the contiguous U.S. was in drought. Yeah. Leading to an active wildfire season, this is which very, we have discussed on the we, show. This is very worrying. Okay, our last item is from Clean Technica, and this that photograph, an believe it or not, has scads of huge wind turbines in it. Well, you got to really look because you <laughs> almost can't see them. Almost. I can see them pretty well here, but I, on my computer at home, I couldn't see them at all. Yeah, this is. So from, that's an offshore wind farm, and it's in a foreground, and it must be fifty. Oh, there, I, think one. There's, I think there's more than 50. There's probably more than 50, yeah. but there's nothing, nothing but wind turbines. Yep, this is from Clean Technica. New report, quote, private sector investment in UF, U.S. offshore wind will soar to $109 billion by 2030. A new peer-reviewed, a new peer-reviewed, reviewed projections show investment by U.S. offshore wind industry will total $109 billion within 10 years. That figure represents a 40% increase from earlier estimates that, was cal that were calculated just two years ago. Well, the offshore sector is aggressively moving toward, this is our, our offshore sector, yeah. moving toward a national goal of building 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Now, Tom, please explain this. What's gigawatts a gigawatt? Gigawatts. <laughs> Major private sector investment in the offshore supply, ch supply chain is certain. That's, that's kind of a, a sub-theme of this article. Absolutely. That pe if you're going to be putting these things up, you need people building th plants to help you do it. That's right. And, and they're and talking we, about these things growing up in various places. The number of people who are going to be employed is very large. There, are, there will be more people employed in the offshore wind industry by probably a fa factor of two than there currently are in coal. That's interesting. Well, the, the next question is, which state becomes the offshore wind manufacturing center? Well, you know that they've started big time in, in Massachusetts. Yes. And Rhode Island and New Jersey. And, you know, I, I'm, I don't know what they're doing in Maryland and, and Virginia, but you know that there's going to well, be Well, this is there. a big opportunity. It's they a huge all want opportunity. To get on the they do. On and those, those companies that are making things down there are not going to be the companies that supply the offshore wind in the, in the western uh, end of the Gulf of Mexico. And they're not, certainly not going to supply wind turbine blades to offshore wind uh, in California. Now, so, here we're talking about the amount. Atlantic coast in the eastern part of the Gulf. Yeah. Okay, we are at our limit, and so I'm going to wish everybody to have a fantastically fortuitous week. Well, I'm going to put you up so you can say that again. Have a fantastically <laughs> fortuitous week. Tom, why don't you put us both up? You deserve to be up. You that, always, would, that would be clever, you, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be clever. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Time to wave goodbye. Have a good week. Whoop. Come back next time. There you go. <laughs>